Um, fire is an interesting word. It always comes up in uh, freedom of speech discussions. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. This might be a nice occasion for a little call and response. Uh, I'll call out a question and you shout back the one word response. What's the word you're not allowed to shout in a crowded theater? Fire! Another. What's the word you're not allowed to shout in a crowded theater? Fire! One last one. What's the word you're not allowed to shout in a crowded theater? Fire! Huh. I just think we set a new record in freedom of speech. <laughs> it might be a new low. <laughs> Who knows more about fire than anyone is our speaker, Stephen Pine. Well, good evening, and thank you for coming, and thanks to the Long Now Foundation for allowing me to come and speak today, this evening, about fire. In all of its forms, uh, this will be uh, a rapid uh, a rapid survey, perhaps the historical equivalent of a planetary flyby, uh, will cover a lot of ground, a lot of history. So, fasten your seatbelts, phasers on stun, and we'll go. I got interested in fire, engaged with fire first shortly after I turned 18, and signed on as a smoke chaser at the North Rim of Grand Canyon. I returned for 15 seasons in all, and became a pyromantic not a pyromaniac, important distinction. <laughs> well, on a fire crew, you quickly learn how fires shape a season and how fire seasons can shape a life. And I wondered if the same might be true for humanity. After all, we are uniquely fire creatures on a uniquely fire planet. So eventually I traded in my Pulaski for a pencil, became a scholar on fire, and tonight I'll give you the short, the short version of what I've learned. Well, among the ancient elements, fire is the odd man out. Earth, air, water, all are substances. But fire is a reaction. It synthesizes its surroundings. It takes its character from its context. So it may be nature's first uh, experiment in postmodernism. <laughs> but fire is a shapeshifter, and that has, been, that has proved true intellectually as well. The other Ancient elements all have academic disciplines devoted to their study, even whole departments. But the only fire department on a university campus is the one that sends emergency vehicles when an alarm sounds. I think the best way to think about fire is to realize that it's a product of the living world. Fire on Earth exists because of life on Earth. Life created the oxygen. Life created and rearranges and organizes the fuels and as soon as life began colonizing the continents, it began to burn, and it's burned ever since. We have fossil charcoal that dates back 420 million years. You can find fire scars in trees in the petrified forest. But fire burned patchily. Different places burn in different ways, different eras, burn with different intensities. So as life changes, as the atmosphere changes, so fires change. So quickly, if we go back, we're starting to reconstruct some of the paleo history of fire, first evidence of fire. As plants begin to diversify, oxygen is still relatively low, not so many fires. Plants increase, oxygen increases, lots of fires, and then an overwhelming amount of fire. And that only ends with an extinction event because the stuff that makes fire possible disappeared, so fire disappears uh, with it or changes its character. Or if we were to put a grand scroll across it, we'd see eras with high fires, eras with low fires. Current fire world has been whipsawed between fire and ice, glacial and interglacial, although there's plenty of evidence now that we're, we are in a new era even a geologically significant era, driven by ourselves, and I would argue, driven by our capacity over fire. So for most of history, natural history, fire, in the form of fast combustion, 
competed with slow combustion, that is metabolism, respiration, decomposition in the organic world. They tend to compete. And when this really becomes, this is a very difficult problem to sort out. It's really fire ecology's three-body problem. There's no exact solution. Everything is always a little bit out of sync. But this has gone on for a long time. What underlies it is patterns of wetting and drying. It has to be wet enough to grow stuff, then dry enough to burn. So in Arizona, where I come from, if we have wet winters, the deserts burn. If we have dry winters, the mountains burn in the summer. Otherwise, you would depend on ignition source, which is almost always lightning, overwhelmingly lightning, and that is pretty much a kind of lottery. Or it was, until the creature arrives who could wrest control away from lightning, in effect, seize control over ignition. This is a real phase change in the natural history of the planet. This is a real marker uh, in human history as well. Because people can now begin rearranging, redistributing, redefining the domain of fire, increasing it, in effect making a pact with fire that will expand fire's domain at the same time fire will empower humans in a huge way. We got small guts and big heads because we learned to cook food. We went to the top of the food chain because we learned to cook landscapes. And now we've become a geologic presence because we're cooking the planet. We have become, have been for a long time, and increasingly, with increasing authority, been the keystone species for fire on the planet, directly and indirectly. You know, other creatures knock over trees and dig holes in the ground, hunt, eat plants. We do fire. Our environmental power, our, our ecological signature, and in many ways our, our environmental presence is really a firepower. And as we've learned to expand it, uh, our own presence on the planet has increased. So fire has long been the focus of social life, the hearth, what could be long the definition of a family, those who shared a hearth. Around fires we worked, we made things, we played, we worshipped. Around fires we told the stories about who we were, who we are, how we've come to be. Focus, by the way, for, for the linguists in the, in the crowd, focus is the Latin word for hearth. Literally the focus of human life. Fire was very likely our first domestication. Think about the terms, particularly in English, we use to describe how we tend, feed, care for, fire, the things you have to do. Uh, in effect, the domus was made to protect the fire more than the people. It's certainly a catalyst for technology, very little of technology, and the further back in time you go, the more powerful this is, this is the case, does not rely on fire somewhere as an all-purpose catalyst to speed up and make possible. We can transform um, mud uh, into bricks, sand uh, into glass, or into metals. How much of our technology relies on fire? Our chemistry. Even our, our philosophers, per ignum, through fire. Fire was the means that you transmuted things, made the dross world into a knowable world and indeed a habitable world. And because of its presence, its ability to empower us, I think fire may very well also be our first Faustian bargain, something that we're still having to deal with. Well, fire tended to occupy two forms. One was a closed, one in a, in a built environment, in a, in a domus or uh, some kind of forge or confined place, and then fire in the landscape. And for the most part, these two played equally out. But uh, in time, the two will come to interact in curious ways. Aboriginal fire was a very powerful one. By Aboriginal fire, I mean that fire economy which is based on the ability to determine the place and time of ignition. It's very powerful in places that already have fire. You can take over that landscape very quickly by changing the timing of the fire, by preemptively burning, by altering the way it appears. But it's very difficult to introduce fire where, it, where the environment is not going to tolerate it. The power of landscape fire resides in the power to propagate. And that, does, that is not something under people's control except to the extent that they can control where and when they burn. So if you want 
more power, if you want to increase your ability to manipulate the world through fire, you're going to have to change that environment. So you're going to start slashing and drying. You're going to drain. You're going to introduce livestock and other, other ways to churn up the landscape, to put it into a form that will make it more amenable to burning, so that now you can begin burning where nature would never have burned. And you can begin burning in ways and times that wouldn't have been possible. But this too comes with limits. You know, it, it's limited by the ability of that particular ecosystem to grow fuels in a, quote, sustainable way. If you overdo it, the system begins winding down, or what Linnaeus and others called leaves a world of rich parents and poor children. So if you want to increase your, your firepower, and it seems a large number of us always do, you'll have to find another source of things to burn. And we have an endless search around the countryside for stuff. So we can move our farms and pastures through forests, through the landscape, or we can rotate the landscape um, through a particular plot. But in some way or another, you're looking for fallow. You know, and, and European agronomists have always hated fallow. They've detested it for at least a couple thousand years. They have denounced it in literature. It's a waste, a waste of land uh, that needs to be put into production. And worse, it's burned. You know, I think, well, maybe if you look at this as a fire historian and you realize that almost all agriculture outside of floodplains where water can take the place of fire for fertilizing and fumigating, almost all those places need fire, maybe they got it backwards. Maybe it's not burned to get rid of it. Maybe it's grown in order to be burned because at some point you're going to need that ecological jolt, that kind of biotic defibrillation that fire provides. But nonetheless, you can run out. And there are crazy stories, people even bringing seaweed and drying it out to get more stuff to put on the landscape so they can get the proper fire. So eventually we turned to lithic landscapes. We found another source of things to burn. And we began burning them in different ways on a huge scale. This again is another phase change in the history of fire. And I, I think in the history of the planet. We began putting them into machines, burning them into various appliances, applying that, our firepower indirectly, but also multiplying it. So here's Matthew Bolton, uh, James Watts, business partner, remarking, here's what we sell, sir. We sell what all the world desires to have, power. So as we began industrializing, these two kinds of fires, burning surface biomass and burning fossil biomass, begin to cross one another, mostly in the 19th century, particularly in the late 19th century, with very interesting and sometimes uh, very exotic results. I think of this transition, I, I like to call it the pyric transition. And I do so by analogy to the de better known demographic transition in human populations. In this case, we're talking about a population of fire. It explodes. Many more sources. Landscape is being churned up. Lots more stuff to burn. Lots of abusive burning, reckless burning, promiscuous burning. And then, after the new order begins to take hold, all the older fires begin disappearing. And you, you're left below replacement values. So we're not able to reproduce the fires that the ecosystem needed before. How do we do it? Well, it operates by substituting pyrotechnologies, use electricity instead of um, open flame. We actively suppress fires. Open flame is pretty much forbidden, becoming even more so in built landscapes. And we change how we live on the land. Where we, where we needed fire previously, we find surrogates for it. We begin putting houses into formerly rural landscapes. Industrial societies love to create nature reserves, parks, wilderness, preserves of one kind. All this changes the way fire is going to appear on the land because the keystone species has changed 
how it does business. So we substitute for power in many forms, it's now indirect, but we also use that new mechanical power to actively fight fires and take it out of the landscape. So we're left with a, with a curious case that in much of the developing world, uh, there's an overabundance of bad fires, and in much of the developed world, there's a deficit of good fires. But the same thing happens intellectually at roughly the same time, very curious. At the same time, fire begins being, being confined, being put into some kind of appliances, being taken out of the landscape, being taken out of houses um, and factories, out of sight, out of mind. It starts disappearing from intellectual history as well. Since ancient times, fire had been recognized as a fundamental property. Uh, Heraclitus famously said that all things are in exchange for fire and fire for all things. Well, he was known as Heraclitus the Dark, with good reason. But even in Aristotelian physics, fire was the model system. You had to explain change in the world, and if you couldn't explain fire, you couldn't do it. But by th as the Enlightenment settles in, particularly after the discovery of oxygen, and oxygenation as a, for, as, a chem, as a primary chemical reaction, fire goes from being a fundamental phenomenon, even an informing principle, into a subset. It disappears into oxidation chemistry, disappears into thermodynamics, electromagnetism, physiology, the question of animal heat, which had always been thought of as a kind of fire, has now become so. Fire disappears. It's no longer discussed as an organizing presence. It becomes a subset of the more fundamental disciplines, which is the situation we still have today. This conversion, most of us, uh, I'm sure in this room, are, are aware of, of uh, some of the consequences for the atmosphere, but this conversion has cascaded throughout the planet uh, and is affecting all forms. In, in the past, the human problem with fire had been primarily to search for new sources, to find new stuff to burn. There was never enough until, until fairly recently. Now it's essentially unbounded. It's not infinite, but we keep finding new stuff to burn, and we can burn a whole lot more than is good for us. And the problem has become one of sinks, what to do with all the effluent from the stuff we're burning. It's also, I think, marking a change, it will have to mark a change in how we understand the Earth system and the role of fire in it. Because for a long, long time, fire had been seen as a subset of natural history, particularly of climate history. But increasingly, I think we have to make, we have to realize that natural history, the Earth system, and even climate history are becoming subsets of fire history. In fact, I would suggest we could rename the Anthropocene, if you wished, as the Pyrocene. Because fire, fire is the driving power uh, that allows us uh, to make the kinds of changes we've been making. And I suggest it not simply as an alternative. We're not simply in an interglacial. But fire itself may now have the informing presence imposing itself on the planet in the way that ice had earlier. Well, we'll see. You know, these are great photos, Earth at night. You've all seen them. But if you're interested in fire, you quickly realize there are two sources of light here. So we have Western Europe ablaze with lights, and not all those lights are the result of industrial combustion. Uh, there are other sources, but you can bet that kind of combustion is somewhere in the chain of their creation, and all of them are substituting for open flame. Sub-Sahara Africa wash with flame. There are a few places where lights dominate, and this, is, this seems to be the case. They don't coexist. They don't play well with each other. You have one or the other, and you have some transition period between them. There are some extreme cases. I'm sure many of you have seen photos like this. this these have been around for a long time. This is a more recent one, North Korea, conspicuous by the absence of light at night. But if you look at the modus imagery of hot spots during the day, you see exactly the opposite. So here, very little environmental difference, no cultural difference, 
a human event, a war, 60 years ago, uh, has caused a change in these two. You know, we often hear in the fire community, if you're familiar with the fire community or a member of it or deal with them, you'll often hear the expression, hey, fire knows no borders. Oh, really? Seems to me it pretty well respects the DMZ. (laughs) (laughs) This transition, as I suggested, is a time of, of extensive, even abusive burning. These are all from the 19th century, early 20th century United States. The U.S. at the time was much like Brazil in recent years, basically an agricultural society, rapidly industrializing, undergoing this transition, landscape, clearing, uh, railroads. This was the Trans-Amazon Highway of its day going into uh, Michigan. Uh, Lots of wreckage. The one in the upper right is my favorite. These, These are coastal redwoods in California converted to dairy farms. So it didn't take a lot to realize that something's amiss here. But as I suggested, you, we go from this, this situation, these circumstances of almost a fire orgy, and after the new order is established, we end up with a fire famine. And we'll see how that plays out in a minute. But that kind of wreckage, lives lost, cities, new towns overrun, landscapes, natural resources uh, destroyed, did not go unnoticed. And all progressive thinkers of the day decided something would have to intervene to stop this ruination by axe and fire, and that would have to be the state. And so we see as a global project the emergence of state-sponsored conservation with fire very much a part of that scene, really animating and giving urgency uh, to these arguments. Uh, The first professional forester in the U.S. actually emigrated from Prussia, Bernard Furneaux, he looked over the scene and he, he dismissed it as one of bad habits and loose morals. He said the civilized country would never tolerate this. So we took the steps that a civilized country should take. We intervened to end it. And we were not alone. But the task, importantly, was given to foresters. It didn't have to be. It was given to a group that emerged out of Central Europe, that is temperate Europe, an odd part of the world because climatically, You don't have wet, dry periods. Precipitation is more or less constant. There's no natural basis for fire. There's no dry lightning. So the only fires you see in this environment are fires that people put in. So it was seen as a human problem solely. No ecological basis for fire. No justification for it. Forestry becomes the oracle and, in a sense, the engineering core for free-burning fire because fire has disappeared out of academic circles this point. So the study of fire is now given over to a group which fundamentally detests it and is dedicated to its extirpation. And that will have consequences. As I say, this was a global project. It was pursued in the northern Rockies and the central provinces of India. They're in the upper, uh, on the upper right, uh, hilltop forester in India under uh, the British uh, regime. Uh, There he is, looking for fires, big drum, goes down, beats the drum out the message so the local villagers will come help him, put it out. Well, the villagers were the ones who in all likelihood said it, with to their mind good cause, so they were not in the least interested. Nonetheless, this this was a major undertaking by British India. Any of you fans of the, of Kipling's Jungle Books? Ever wonder what happened to Mowgli after he goes to the man village and grows up? Well, Kipping wrote a story, a sequel that describes what happens. Mowgli joins the Indian Forest Service. He becomes a fire guard. And he fights against poaching and jungle fires. And I like that because, uh, as, as, as sort of loony as it seems, it shows the depth and the pervasiveness of these ideas among thinkers of the day. So the great architect of the British system in India, Dietrich Brandes, a German botanist turned forester, uh, administrative genius, set it up. And one of the major ways they decided to handle the problem was to create forest reserves. Then there were some special attention reserves. We would consider parks today. 
And that's sort of the buildup of this. So it took several forms, but this was the primary one. And by this, they could break the cycle of abuse. That's the growth of national forests and equivalent public lands in the United States. It's going on at the same time. Gifford Pinchot, the first chief of the Forest Service beginning in 1905, studied under Brandis. His successor studied under Brandis, went to India. They wanted to adapt that system, bring it to the US. Pinchot said he hoped to achieve some little bit in this country of what Brandis had achieved in India. It's a remarkable statement. He later, he later thought that we had a lot to learn from the French in Algeria. Other than getting out, I don't know what that would be. But nonetheless, this was the same model that was applied. We created public domains from colonized lands. Now that larger fire story I've been telling you is the one we share with the rest of the planet. This story of creating a kind of public land or crown land out of colonized uh, countries is one we share with those countries that have very similar fire problems to ours. Who are they? Well, Australia, Canada, Russia. They all have a similar history of land tenure and the creation of forest institu forestry institutions to manage them and so forth. But the paradox here is that they created these reserves to protect them from all the fires outside. And instead, what they wound up doing was creating a permanent habitat for free burning fire within, because these were not going to be subject to this pyric transition that would happen outside it. So why do the major fire powers today have extensive wildland fires? Because they have extensive wildlands. And that is a historic artifact. And in all these cases, wherever uh, France, Britain, Netherlands, US, else went, they created the same kind of programs to eliminate fire from the landscape as fully as possible often by a kind of paramilitary model. So, we, we spiraled, big story, fire, secondary story, those countries that have all these wildland fire problems. Let's spend a few minutes talking about the US. I'll be fairly brief, but I think we can, we can break down uh, our national story uh, in a way that, that makes sense within this larger narrative. So it's a kind of nested narrative within. <coughs> the backdrop are all these wild abusive, I mean hundreds of people are being killed throughout the American West, uh, around the Great Lakes, other settlement areas. That's the backdrop. U.S. Forest Service is created, given the National Reserves, 1905, that's really the beginning of the modern story. 19, 1910, they were hit with a wave of fires, the famous big blow up, traumatized the agency. It was a kind of long march for those young foresters and they would never forget it. They would never allow a fire like that again to happen on their watch. And it wasn't until that entire generation is gone. The next three chief foresters of the Forest Service were all personally on the fire lines in the Northern Rockies during the big blow up. They lost 78 firefighters, six different incidents, all in one afternoon, evening. Million dollars over budget. That was real money in 1910. The agency could have been bankrupt and defunct. But that brought together a pattern and that has stayed with us through the century. So for the next 50 years, borrow a little ecological language here, we adopted a kind of resistance model. We would not allow fire to become a threat and the way to stop it was to attack every fire while it was small. Every fire could be controlled when it started. So you did everything you could to get there as quickly as you could, put out all fires, and it turns out if you take people out of these landscapes in a lot of these places, lightning, lightning fills in very nicely. So you haven't eliminated fires. The big boost comes in the 1930s with the Civilian Conservation Corps. In effect, a civilian army that could be put to work, putting in an infrastructure for fire control and actually fighting fires. It's estimated that about half of all the CCC labor went into fire protection in one way or another. California was particularly aggressive in this. In fact, uh, the Ponderosa Way was a gigantic fuel break that went from Bakersfield to Redding. It was intended to divide the brush from the timber 
uh, permanently, a kind of huge Maginot line. And it was done with CCC labor. Then after World War II and Korea, lots and lots of military surplus equipment becomes available. We mechanize overnight and we adopt again a kind of paramilitary model under the direction of the Forest Service uh, to fight fire. This is a staged photo. It's actually near Mount Shasta. You suppress all, all other kinds of arguments. There was a big debate in 1910, the same time that the fires are burning, that, hey, this whole approach is wrong. We should be emulating the American Indian and practicing what was called light burning. And even the Secretary of the Interior agreed. But it became very quickly politicized, and you're either with us or against us on this. And uh, the fire suppressors won. So here we are, finally, by 1960, basically in a Cold War on fire, or what, what the more uh, eager opponent, proponents called the Red Menace. <laughs> All of this was under the direction of the U.S. Forest Service, which after 1910 acquired the authority to establish federal state programs for fire protection. It, it controlled virtually everything. And in fact, it was, it was a benign hegemon, and fire was increasingly becoming something that didn't belong with average people. It was becoming a government monopoly in the name of public safety. Well, it couldn't survive. And part of the problem is that you took out good fires as well as bad fires. And after a few decades, it became obvious that economically, ecologically, even administratively, this program was insane. It could not, it could not persist. We couldn't keep pumping more and more into it because it's harder and harder to keep a lid on. So by the 1960s, fire joins a lot of other developments. And in effect, we can speak of a fire revolution. And part of that was the development of a civil society, no longer funded through the Forest Service or even the feds. So the Tall Timbers Research Station, a private operation in Tallahassee, Florida, becomes a very important uh, a megaphone for advertising the value of fire and the necessity of it. A month after their first uh, conference, the Nature Conservancy conducts its first prescribed burn. The Nature Conservancy now burns as much as the National Park Service and will probably surpass it the way the MPS is going these days. And lots, even iconic species, are now identified as in need of fire. So our, our charismatic megaflora, you know, three of our first four national parks were all devoted to those trees. Now it turns out we need to be putting fire back in those. By 1968, the National Park Service had reformed its policy, seeking to restore fire. By 1978, the U.S. Forest Service had followed suit. What happened? Well, it was a revolution from the top. It seemed that the torch, indeed, was being passed to a new generation. But then it went out. Now, the model was based on prescribed burning, particularly in the southeast. Florida is still world center for this. Tallahassee is really the Silicon Valley of prescribed fire. If you, want to, if you want to know how to burn, that's where you go. We projected that into natural fires, beginning in the Sierras, some of the spots, and then elsewhere. And then even for fighting wildfire, you were given options. Hey, you don't have to throw everything but the Seventh Fleet at this, at this little smoke. You can back off. There are other ways to do it, and we'll still call it uh, control. So all of that was in place, and then it fell apart. In the 1980s, there is, in effect, a counter-revolution politically, even in terms of weather. Lots of things. I'd be happy to talk about them later if you want. But in effect, the fire revolution stalled. It wasn't enough to roll it back. You couldn't go back to impose the old order. It would be like putting the Soviet Union back in in place. But you could prevent it from advancing, and it stalled. And that was really, I think, the last time we had a window, not a very large window. Even if all, everything had been done right, we might not have been able to make it. But we could have. This was our last chance to establish some reasonable anchor points and build out from it, and that time passed. The revolution starts over again, change of administrations, Big fires in California, the South Canyon Fire, 94 in Colorado, burned over a fire crew, told the fire community, hey, fire suppression is broken. 
we can't do this anymore. Something has got to change. So it starts up, having to cold start over again. Ever since then, fires have gotten bigger, the costs have gotten greater, the difficulties increase, becoming more complicated. We're playing catch up. And the sense, I think, is fairly pervasive in the fire community that we're probably not going to catch up. So I think we're in the process right now of inflecting into what we might call a resilience model. Okay, it's an overused term, but I think it may be apt. How do we get more good fires? How do we keep down the bad fires? We're not going to get ahead of the problem. What kind of arrangement can we make that will allow us to survive? what's coming at us. Well, one way to think about it is to realize we don't have a fire problem. We have lots of fire problems. Hey, break it down. Parse it. Some of, some of the issues that we face now have actually got technical solutions. I mean, we know how to keep houses from burning. We've known that for a long time. We solved that problem. Watching communities, hundreds of houses being taken out at a shot, is like watching measles or polio come back. Hey, we fixed that. Why did we quit doing all the stuff that we needed to do? And in some ways, it's because we misdefined the problem. We think of it as a wildland problem with houses instead of as an urban problem with funny landscaping. <laughs> but what's really spooky, to me anyway, is the way our fire issues are beginning to channel all of our other national pathologies and topics. Land use is polarizing. Hey, these communities, national parks, wilderness areas, high protected areas, they get a lot of attention. What about that broad middle landscape? It's up for grabs. It's going to burn. It's going to burn under conditions that probably none of us would like. We even now have our one percenters, the so-called megafires. Actually, they're 0.1 percent when you break it down. They account for about 80 to 90 percent of the costs in burned area now. We have taken out our middle range of fires. We have lots of little fires that we catch, and then we have these giant fires that we can't do anything about, which are burning more area than if we'd had lots of middle fires. So we've, we've perverted the whole, the whole arrangement. So where are we now? Well, I think there are three, all these strategies are still in place, sort of historically re, you know, inherited, but they're still operating. There's a large crowd that wants to go back to the way it was. Let's just bomb these things out of existence. Let's get some really big planes. Let's do a lot of technology. Let's get really serious and knock these things out. We did it before, we'll do it again. They want to reassert suppression and they want to change fire into more of an all-hazard emergency service. Well, there are a lot of reasons for doing that if you're dealing with urban areas. Actually, this is the model of CAL FIRE, which has become an urban fire service out in the woods. It's hard to remember that not so many decades ago, it was, it was a land management agency. Now it's a, an emergency service. And that's a, great, that's a great system if your primary land use is urban sprawl. It's not a great fire system if you're trying to do things with fire to get a lot of ecological goods and service. But that's a very attractive political approach. It's happening around the world. The US and Australia are probably the most aggressive at resisting it at the moment. The restoration strategy is still alive. It's inspirational to many people. A lot of people are doing all they can to make this work. And their goal is to change the context. Remember, the way you control fire is by controlling its setting. They want to get ahead of the problem. We can identify the strategic areas. We can harden the assets. We can create more robust landscapes. We'll have to do more than just burn. We may have to do mechanical treatments. We may have to do um, some herbicides. We may have to do mix up some grazing and wildlife management. We haven't even begun to think about serious ecological engineering. Where's the fire equivalent of integrated pest management? Well, partly because we've defined fire as a physical problem, we take physical countermeasures. So we dump water, we dump retardant, we move hydrocarbons around. That's not really addressing the issue. The problem with the restoration strategy is one of scale. Temporal scale, geographic scale. 
Arizona has the largest experiment underway, four forest restoration project, four national forests, relatively homogeneous forests. If you can't make it work here, you can't make it work anywhere. Their goal for 10 years was to treat 50,000 acres a year, half a million acres at the end of 10 years. Well, they're already three years behind actual production. They're now down to a goal of 30,000 acres a year. And meanwhile, in 2011, a fire burned 538,000 acres in three days. This takes a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot of political capital, a lot of social capital. We're probably going to be able to protect our sequoia groves, our municipal watersheds. We can protect our communities. We're not going to protect the larger landscape. So finally, resilience. And I think this is what I sense in the fire community now, particularly the coming generation. Hey, it's too late. Too many things are coming at us too fast. We're not going to get ahead of this problem. We're going to try to provide point protection. Otherwise, we're going to back off, burn out, draw boxes, burn out the boxes. We'll rebuild landscapes out of the large fires that we've got because we're not going to be able to get ahead of it. This is not restoration. This is not moving towards desired future conditions. This is not even applied science as we traditionally think of it, that science informs and management acts upon it. This is just playing catch up so that we'll come through with, with, with something left at the end. Well, all three are in play. I think of them as a kind of rock, scissors, paper game. At any one moment, one triumphs over the other and is in turn beaten. And we need them all. We need rocks to protect against bad fires. We need scissors to help promote good fires. And we need paper hey, because the ideal can be the enemy of the good. And, this, and a managed wildfire, as oxymoronic as that may sound, may be what we have to deal with. It's a paradox. Live with it. Because this is what's, go this is what's going to happen. Coming up, we're going to have to think differently. We're going to have to think outside the fire triangle. And I think the prophet Ezekiel had it right. Because we shall go out from one fire and another fire shall devour us. We're not going to solve the fire problem. We can solve parts of the fire problem. But we are always going to have to deal with fire. Because it's not just a tool. It's not just an ecological process. It's also a relationship. So... I spiraled down, now let's, let's go back and try to end up here. The long history of fire. Hundreds of millions of years, natural fire. Patchy in the world. Anthropogenic fire expands the domain of fire enormously and recodes the patches and pulses under which it burned. And then we come to industrial fire. You can see I'm no graphic artist, but trying, trying to indicate a thick landscape because we're now taking stuff out of the geologic past and passing it on to the geologic future. And that is changing how fire appears on the landscape. In particular, anthropogenic fire is going. And because we like nature reserves, we're having lots of wildfire returning. So we have two grand combustion realms symbolized by the map. We've got three kinds of fire. The problem for sustainability is going to be to divide three into two and have something left over. Because if we don't, we are simply seeding the world to feral fire. Okay, technology can enable and science can inform, but ultimately we make our choices on our values, how we see ourselves and the world. How do we see fire? Two very different visions of a future world and fire. Biosphere 2, completely sustainable, engineered world, something we could plop down on Mars in principle. There is no place for fire in Biosphere 2, zero. Behind it, the Santa Canalita Mountains, full-throated wildfire, the Aspen Fire, roaring over the top. This is a place that not only will have fire, but needs fire. How are those two going to be reconciled? Or equally to the point, what's missing in this image and what's, what's become missing in our, our narrative of fire is a middle that shows us 
using fire constructively to make a more habitable world. So, let's go back as we approach the future. Let's go back to the past. Fire as a creation of the living world, ourselves as keepers of the torch. I think we have two, two big narratives. One I'll call the Promethean narrative. And this speaks of fire as a technology. Fire is something wrested away from its, its, its site, perhaps by violence, and certainly held in defiance of the existing order. This is the fire in our machines, and we need a lot less of it. The other narrative, let's call it a primeval narrative. And it speaks of fire as a companion. It's part of our shared stewardship, managing the planet. We are the creature who is supposed to get fire right for the rest of creation. We need a lot more of this. I particularly like the kid. Well, how else is he going to learn how to burn if he doesn't walk around carrying a fire stick? No wonder he's grinning. <laughs> well, our past is a record of how we have used our firepower, and our future will be a record of what we've learned from that experience. And that's a story that's yet to be written. But I think when the time comes to tell it, I'll bet we choose to do so around a fire. <laughs> and with that, I thank you. Many thanks, Stephen. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, the revolution from the top failed. And in the 90s, you felt there was a, a time, if only that revolution of understanding, this more sort of organic approach to fire, if it had been in place, all would have been well. How exactly would that have, been, that have played out if we hadn't lost those decades? I think what we would have had is uh, an array of, of sort of model landscapes with fire. And those would have become points of positive infection, and they would have inspired and helped make the transition um, to a better landscape. Instead, um, funding was pulled. Um, fire research nearly went, nearly folded hmm. in the mid 80s. Uh, they were talking about making a final stand at the Missoula Fire Lab, if necessary. Uh, they would <laughs> Circle their circle their their engines and mm -hmm. and hold off as long as they could, um, and I think you also needed and political tolerance uh, was reduced, and that was at, at all levels. You're going to make mistakes, you know. You're doing something we don't know how to do. How do you manage wildfires in, in areas? And so somebody makes a mistake and they get slammed, mm -hmm. but there are no guidance. Well, here's what you did wrong. Here's here's how to do it right. There's no, there are no rules of engagement. And so people in the ground weren't willing to take that risk. You said as early as 1910, there was a, a counter argument to the fight every fire as early as you can. Smokey the bear and all that. And only you can stop forest fires. Bambi. Yeah, that's the one that we all, I grew up on. And you know, oh my God, the fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, But starting in 1910, you said there was some awareness of how Native Americans had basically managed the North American landscape with fire. How would, you know, how would you describe that? I mean, there's a book here in California called Tending the Wild yeah. by Cat Anderson, yeah. which is basically how the many tribes of California uh, kept the entire state in order with very, very um, sophisticated burning in terms of seasons, what times, what place, all of that. And that stopped with the arrival of um, the non-Indians. And, uh, and then it, it went away. And, and Kat has in her preface one point where she's going up on a mountain ridge, I think up in the Trinity Alps and looking out. And uh, she's with a local tribal guy. And uh, they're looking out at this. And he says, look at it. It's just wilderness now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and he was disgusted. Yeah. Um, 
So what, what's your sense of what the Indian mode at its best was? And is there any piece of that one can do now? I know of some yeah. pyromaniac Indians who would like to bring back native California burning. Well, I, obviously we can't go back, but we can certainly learn. I think, from those experiences. Right now, when we adopted prescribed fire as a kind of applied science approach, mm -hmm. so we would do science, we would write prescriptions, we would designate a particular place, a particular time, have checklists. Mm -hmm. That's what the prescriptions meant. And that turns out to be a formula for failure because it's always possible to have something stop it. You only need one thing to stop it. You're out of prescription. But there's no way to speed it up. So what you need, I mean, we're going more and more now to really large landscape scale, but we need the, the temporal side of that. It's mm -hmm. not one day. Hey, you're following the snow, the melting snows up the mountain. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're burning as things are curing. You're going back to the same spot more than once. This is the kind of almost fire foraging mm -hmm. that I think characterized many Aboriginal societies mm -hmm. uh, using fire. And that's what you need to learn from. So well, we had that debate, and uh, interestingly enough, British India had that debate in the 1870s. The first question they asked, they printed up all their conferences, the first forestry conference on this topic, first question was, is fire control possible? And if it's possible, is it desirable? Wow. And right at the start, there's a split. Mm -hmm. All the administrators, the intellectuals, the authorities, the military, all want fire control, because they see that as controlling the landscape and the population. All the people on the ground say, this is crazy, it's not going to work. And they predicted everything that would go wrong. So was it the case in, in India that the Indians uh, did their manage the landscape with fire? Oh, absolutely. The same as here or different? Oh, yes. Wow. It's okay. pretty much common, and you see the same patterns. And the pattern, the pattern is one of burning. By a particular, I mean, India is perfect because you've got this well-defined monsoon. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. right. it, 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 so you would burn, you would start burning little bits early in the season where it's not going to spread. You protect the areas you most want protected, and then you keep adding to the patches. Mm -hmm. And then by the time the early dry lightning storms come, or th the driest period, you've protected everything you want. So any fire that happens by accident or arson or lightning isn't doing any damage. So you're protecting it by denying it fuel, basically. Right. You preemptively burned it. Sort of a backfire in time. That's right. Um, Manuel Meta asks, how are control burns regulated at local level, state level, fed? Um, somebody in California <laughs> wanted to do a control burn. Where do they go for permission and guidance? Yeah, good question. <laughs> uh, at all levels, uh, all kinds of authorities are involved. Uh, fire can be damaging, escape fires, uh, liability issues are acute. And not just the fire, it's the smoke. So you've got uh, horrible air quality, San Joaquin Valley, and we're talking about burning millions of acres in the Sierra mm -hmm. that will then send lots of smoke down. This is going to be a tough sell. Um, California was a leader a century ago in light burning mm -hmm. and in doing it. And we've got photos, lots of stuff. What do you do today? It's tough. My, my best advice would be that, uh, again, to go to civil society. And there is a, uh, uh, a coalition of uh, prescribed fire councils, and there is a prescribed fire council for California. Hmm. And I would talk to them. That's a state level thing? Well, it's, it's, not, it's not a state organization, it's a state level. Hmm. Um, and except for Southern California, which is a world unto itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of Northern California chuckles at that one. <laughs> um, the Nature Conservancy is involved, uh, private landowners uh, and others are involved mm -hmm. are doing it, and they realize that if they just operate individually, they'll all get picked off one after another. You, mm -hmm. have, you, have, to, you have to have a massive group uh, to, be able, to be able to counter it. And they can provide assistance, they can provide help, um, and that's where I would go. If I were starting in California, I would look to that group first, hmm. and they can provide sort of model instructions, training, and the rest. So I'll tell you something I saw in um, Indiana, in the um, an area that Nature Conservancy was responsible for, and, and I, their 
They've gone so far in the prescribed burn thing that they now have a randomized computer that is basically duplicating uh, what lightning fires would be like. And so the areas that they're burning, they're burning not at the, you know, the season when it is most convenient for the people and safest and all this kind of thing. They're doing it when lightning might have set a fire and then they're setting it then to see what happens. And what I saw there, and you must have seen this, is areas where they've been doing the prescribed burn that were just flourishing with biodiversity and bioabundance. There was all kinds of life there. Next to pieces of former farmland that had been abandoned, and then either protected or just not used, they'd become instantly a Midwestern forest, relatively depauper, just dark yeah. and empty inside. And you see this rich savanna meadow where they've been burning up to the forest, and there's no life in there. And it, it's pretty fascinating to see. Now, they, as they pointed out, they would like to have buffalo back that used to live yeah. in that part of the country. And then the combination of grazing and burning gives you that mosaic of grasslands savanna and forest that is the richest possible environment. That's true. And uh, there, in, in areas that have succeeded in getting fire back in, the arguments are now about seasonal timing, mm -hmm. about mixtures, and particularly about um, the wildlife. And that's a missing ingredient, because mm. partly because foresters are still directing the fire scene in many ways we've gone into hmm. uh, defining it all in terms of fuel. So it's fuel reduction. It's fuel this, fuel that. Well, that's sort of silviculture by other means. And I'm not, I'm not being cynical mm -hmm. on this. I'm saying that's something they understand. It's a metric that can be measured. Um, administrators like it. Did you, get, did you meet your target or not? Whereas most of the burning, most of the need for the burning is for ecological reasons. So you've got these, these two competing theories. One is, well, we'll get the fuel right by mechanically thinning, doing whatever else. We'll use fire as a tool mm -hmm. uh, to help on that. And then the ecology will sort itself out. The other approach is that, well, we really need to get the ecology right. And if you get the right pattern of fire, then the fuel will, will automatically adjust. But they're two very different mindsets. And they, they approach it in different ways. And one sees fire simply as a tool. And to my mind, well, if it's only a tool for reducing fuel, find another tool. Mm -hmm. Where the real argument for fire is that it's doing ecological work that nothing else does. So is there a trend toward away from the strict forestry model to more of an ecological embracing model that includes animals and people and other things? Yeah, I think there is, uh, but it's slow. And at the national level, the funding is all they want clear metrics. And those metrics are fuels reduced, hydrocarbons shoved around, this kind of thing. And it's interesting, though, that where most of the prescribed burning in the Midwest and elsewhere is most vigorous, it's because of wildlife. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these, all these animals that we like so much, a huge fraction of them, you know, they don't live in old growth, dark, mm -hmm. shaded forests. Right. And they go extinct. Mm -hmm. They leave. They leave. And... Uh, so that becomes a very powerful argument. You want turkeys, you want deer, uh, you want these other animals and all the as associated butterflies and microbes and even the predators and stuff. You're going to have to burn to get this. And you probably have to combine burning with other things. It's really an interactive technology. Mm -hmm. And what's been missing out of the, the fire fuel formula is the animals component, which are very important. And I think I, I was at a Nature Conservancy site uh, in, in western Kentucky. Mm. And they were saying, you know, we just can't get this border between the grasses and the trees right by burning it. You know, we're doing all the fuel stuff and measuring it in the flame. And I'm thinking what's missing is there's probably some biological agents mm. that would work with fire mm -hmm. to do that, and they're missing. There are a lot of things missing, as you know, out of those systems. And that's probably what, what's lacking. Uh, we're working I'm on bringing sorry. back the passenger pigeons who used yep. to tear up the forest just the way yep. the fire did. <laughs> also edible. Um. <laughs> but let's go back. For, for 15 years, season after season, you went back to fighting <laughs> fire. Where were you? What was going on? I was, well, I was at... Uh, I was at the North Rim of Grand Canyon. North Rim of the Grand Canyon. North Rim of the Grand Canyon. The best of Mars. all lives I mean, and that's the best of all places. Yeah. No, it, was, it was great. I started a few days after I graduated from high school. Then I went to the Bay Area. I went to Stanford. 
And so I, I had a, a dual life. You know, half the year, I'm a dedicated student. I'm doing books all the Books in the winter it. and fires in the North Rim in the summer. And then I put all the books aside and uh, put on my boots, pick up a shovel, and we'd go do fire. You were proud and you were fit, and you always knew of what the mission was. It sounds pretty It was. It was. When I started, the mission was very clear. It was the last year, 1967, it was the last year the Park Service operated under the old 10 a.m. policy, which came from the Forest Service, announced in 1935. 10 a.m. policy? That every fire would be controlled by 10 o'clock the next morning. The next morning. Whether it's, you know, 100 feet away from the ranger station or 100 miles, there is one single standard, and that's why you get smoke jumpers, ah. that's why you get aircraft, that's why you get... But, you know, it's very attractive administratively. Mm -hmm. Hey, you either do it or you don't. Did you make it, or if you failed, did you plan to control it by 10 a.m. the next day? Why 10 o'clock? Because that's when inversions right. tend to break up. And it takes off again. And that's with the burning period. Yeah. yeah. So um, now we have hotshot crews. Are they the same or different than what you guys were doing? Well, we were, we were a district crew. We, we were situated, we were situated uh, on the rim. We occasionally went out. Uh, someone... Someone once asked, a visitor came through, saw us wearing our fire shirts, and said, hey, are you guys hot shots? And some guy piped up, no, we're long shots. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> we adopted it. Uh -huh. And we became officially the North Rim long shots. Right. And uh, reviewers and others have consistently confused that and think we really were hot shots. <laughs> no, we weren't. We were much better because we got to know a place. And we got to know fire in a place. Oh, that's We were not just migrant workers going around. Because hot shots are brought in from a great yeah, distance and gangs of them and everything. That's right. Interesting. But they are hot. I mean, they are pretty capable teams, as I get it. They're well trained, um, you know. Uh, and if you've got a going fire, it's, you know, it's blowing and going, and you're in rough country, you want to call them in. Mm -hmm. They're the guys you want. But, you know, is that the way you want to manage fire on the landscape? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're just playing whack-a-mole with fires. And until we could have hot shots every 10 miles, mm. and we're not going to stop. We're not going to solve it. So worldwide, is this a growing problem with the drying that comes with climate change? Yes, or it is. Or is it a changed problem because of that? Well, it changes. Fire is always changing. Mm. And so fire in global change context, fire, fire is a cause. Um, burning peat for conversion in Borneo to mm. palm. I mean, it's a huge source of greenhouse gas, maybe the largest in the world right, right now. It's huge. So fire is part of the problem. On the other hand, drought, other climate-induced changes, um, I mean, fire is a consequence of it. So we get it, and everywhere it's a catalyst. So it, it's Are going our forests burning now because they're drier? And they're burning they're now partly because they're drier, but they're also burning because we've got a legacy landscapes of fuels. We've got broken landscapes. Broken landscapes. Legacy, I sort of understand. We haven't had fire in a long time, so there's a lot of fuel buildup. What's a broken landscape? I just think it's one that's no longer capable of, of regulating itself. It's no longer functioning. Or broken biotas. I want to know more what that means. You want to hear more there's of that? Some, yeah, there's well, some this, this large it, version this you have of a natural landscape that, that has... Well, let me, let me tell you where it comes from. It comes from an analogy, like lots of ideas. And uh, I've, been, I've watched the dominance of the physical model. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in built landscapes, fires, that's what you want. And you fight it with physical countermeasures. And you define the problem as one of an excess of fuels, excess of climate, so... You move hydrocarbons around, you have early warning systems, you build bunkers, you try to attack it at the source. But I'm thinking, you know, a lot of the issues are really because these ecosystems are no longer functioning. Mm -hmm. They're broken biotas. And if we thought about it in more biological terms, we might be thinking about the problem is fixing those landscapes rather than just attacking mm -hmm. fires. Same so if we're okay, not fixing the landscape, but what do you do? Well, there are lots of things. You know, you can rearrange the fuels. You don't have to just haul them off as fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, uh, you can think about uh, thinning. You can think about managing wildlife. Maybe even some prescribed gra grazing here and there, selectively, would be useful. 
uh, you can do lots of things. Let's think about let's think about making this less receptive to the kinds of fires we don't want, but more receptive to the kinds of ones we do. And that doesn't mean nuking the landscape, you know, for 300 feet around houses or every structure. It means landscaping it. Mm -hmm. It means adjusting it. And it may mean, let's think about using biological means. So maybe instead of thinking about this as a, the megafire as, a, as the equivalent of a tsunami or a mega drought or these kinds of large physical climatically driven things, maybe we think about it, this is more like an outbreak of avian flu, or it's like an emergent disease. How would we think about it if, that was, if it was defined in those terms? We would be taking different kinds of measures. In other words, we've defined the problem as a physical one. Maybe we should be thinking about defining it as a more biological one, that these landscapes are no longer functioning as they did. And so what had been a seasonal nuisance is now mutating into something really really rabid. Okay, so I've heard, <laughs> I hang out with the zoologists because okay. uh, we're you know, working with endangered animals, mostly some endangered plants. And there's a lot of talk in that world about the missing megafauna, the big mm -hmm. animals, uh, the big predators and the big herbivores. Uh, and we, you know, we've almost lost the buffalo, and, but we're able to get them back somewhat and they're somewhat substituted for by uh, free-ranging cattle. But there used to be a lot more. And the, what I'm increasingly understanding is that North America was like the Serengeti in terms mm -hmm. of the, just the abundance of enormous, amazing animals, camels and all sorts of things. And likewise, uh, farther north, the so-called mammoth steppe was uh, ahead of these very large animals, which people showed up with spears, and that was the end of the, they were a free lunch and we ate it. Um, do you think big animals back is part of the unbreaking the landscape you're talking about? I think that could be that could be part of it, but that's the kind of thinking we need, because as long as we just define it as too much fuel, uh, we're not we're not really getting at ecological goods and services, which is what we want, and I think that's what's missing out of our efforts to restore these landscapes. I mean, I've, I've looked at the the target, the the thin and burn for ponderosa pine plots outside Flagstaff, Arizona. Bold experiment. My hat's off to them. Go for it, guys. They have an eight-foot fence around that to keep all the animals off because the minute they burn it, the elk are going to be all over that and the rest. So to keep, in a sense, to keep, <laughs> to keep the metrics good, you have to create this artificial environment where the animals are taken out. What would be the problem of the elk coming in? Well, they would. Oh, eat they it. would eat all the. They'd eat it all, and so they would. They would upset the fire pattern because the only way to the only way to do it is to have so much dispersed burning right. that the elk are always around. You overwhelm them; otherwise, they crowd in, and they double down on it. <laughs> you get a problem. So that's what I'm thinking. I mean, if I if I were advising fire science, I would say let's have a biologically based theory of fire to go with the physical one, because we need both. Well, Arizona's doing experiments anyway. How about doing this experiment? There you are, you're at Arizona State, and you know, make it happen. I'm the only fire person at Arizona State. We're not a land grant <laughs> school. I'm a historian, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. I have to. Well, you know, history includes <laughs> the future. Um, Alec <laughs> DeTanto has a question. What direction would you give a future society with no preconceived ideas about how to manage fire? Um, you know, take this start over mode, or you know, there's places in the world, you mentioned the mm -hmm. developing world. The developing world is developing fast. They're moving out of the countryside into the cities. They are, uh, they've got an excess of what you're calling bad fires. And they will now be in a transition as they urbanize, as they move from developing to developed countries. They don't have to make the same mistakes these developed countries did. No. What's your advice to them of how, to, say India, to make uh, the transition and include fire in a wholesome way. Well, India is a bad example because okay, they're China? still so influenced by Worse. by the <laughs> Brits that they, they they don't want any fire, at least uh -huh. in principle. Mexico would be is an interesting one. Okay, and go they there. have actually and they have actually now enacted, at least in law, a principle for uh, prescribed fire. 
So they went for a while. In 1998, they had a very bad fire season. Um, a lot of people killed. A lot of aid, misguided aid from the U.S. and elsewhere to sort of build up a fire suppression organization. So they were trying that, and they realized this doesn't make any sense in this country at all. Hmm. And they need to adapt their traditional agricultural burning uh, to different purposes. And this law will allow them to begin moving in that case. So they are actually slowly taking the right steps. We missed a great opportunity with the breakup of the Soviet Union and all those new countries hmm. to give them an other model than the Soviet one, which was strictly a paramilitary approach. They had 8,500 smoke jumpers cross-trained for repellers. They used explosive cord. It was just a command and control system applied to, to fire. Hmm. And it was, uh, it was a disaster. I mean, it, it works. All these things work very well for a few years. And then the blowback comes, and fire is out of control completely. Mm -hmm. So they lost it. Much of the world is going the wrong way. So They're taking fire and putting it into urban Greece, for example. Poor Greece. It's got so many problems of other sort. But they also took fire away from their forestry service, which managed it on the land, gave it basically to urban fire services, which have no idea. So they lost the countryside, hmm. which is now overgrowing, which is now burning, and now they, they can't control it. They, it it's, it's gone. So I think we missed a chance to tell people what are the right institutions mm -hmm. for fire? How do you support a fire science program? And part of it is that we've never studied that. That it's never, it's never, that kind of social science history has never been considered legitimate research topic. You study fire behavior or you study fire ecology, you do the natural science stuff, that will tell us what we need. And it's not telling us how to make it happen on the ground. So, <clears throat> this sounds pretty bleak, Stephen. Uh, <laughs> where are rays of hope, if any? I think I, th I think there are there are pockets of hope. My my hope, and it may be sort of the last refuge of, if not intellectual scoundrels, uh, others who don't wish to despair, is that I really do see a generation change underway. We've got in the fire community people who are still fighting stuff from the 1960s. I mean, they're going back to their youth, and this is this is what was mattered to them, and they're mm -hmm. going to fight to the bitter end. Mm -hmm. They may be retired, but they organize, and they're still fighting. They're still fighting it. We've got a group of people I meet in in my current research and travels. This stuff doesn't matter to them. They're they're starting from a totally different set of principles, and they accept that fire's got to be in there. We've got to find some way to make it work, and if we can stay out of the way. They'll make lots of mistakes, but I think we'll be better off than what we are now. Are they a and cohort I, that knows about each other, that communicates with each other, that uh, you know, sort of is building a fresh world, or are they just young and, and that's their only no, they're, they're advantage? No, they, the Joint Fire Science Program is one of the real success stories in federal fire. It was, it was created in 1998. Mm -hmm. part of a, it was kind of an internal reorganization of fire at that time. And uh, it took fire out of the Forest Service exclusively. So the Forest Service could still do it, but there were other, other points to get involved. Again, mm -hmm. we're creating a kind of civil society. And a part of that, they have been creating these uh, fire science consortia. Hmm. And so now all the major regions of the country have these, and they are becoming points of gathering. Mm -hmm. So those are good. And we've also created other civil society, this Coalition of Prescribed Burning. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, probably, I think, almost 50 states uh, are, now have contributions. So mm -hmm. we're creating, outside the paralyzed federal system, and in many ways the state system, which is simply charged with, with protection and putting fires out, mm -hmm. uh, we're creating an alternative society, which is seeing things differently. Now, what, what I see potentially happening is that the feds are not going to be able to get it right on most of their land. They're not going to be allowed to. I mean, the Forest Service is starting they to... They have a lot of land, office. so if they're getting it wrong there, that's a lot of wrong. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think they're allowed to, to do things mm -hmm. because we can't decide what we want that land to be. And so we're willing to have it burn. And until the, the burning reaches the point that you're really faced with Solomon's choice, are you really willing to split the child Mm -hmm. Or are you willing to compromise? 
it's, this is what's going to happen. I see the feds, however, as providing support, some logistical support, mm -hmm. some funding support. Most of these local communities don't have the capacity they need. Even if they get it, they, they need an extra supportive equipment. They need some extra, maybe legal advice, creating uh, systems for liability. Mm -hmm. uh, they, need, they need some other assistance, and probably only the feds could do that. So I see the feds making a presence known indirectly. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nature Conservancy has been fairly successful mm -hmm. uh, at using fire without getting sucked into the fire fuel bit, uh, having different targets, being nimble, uh, being able to, uh, to organize uh, clusters of people effectively. The scale is still too small, hmm. but um, there are, these are all points of hope. Uh, so I think maybe focusing on the federal system uh, may be misguiding. I also... Uh, well, Nature Conservancy is the largest conservation organization yeah. in the world, most trusted in all of this. They have most science driven, they have 800 scientists or something like that. Presumably other conservation organizations or similar organizations are emulating some of that, or are they specializing off in different directions? Well, they're also, I mean, all these groups have their own, their own targets. The most effective groups uh, for fire are mostly wildlife groups. People who are interested in turkey or uh, certain kinds of birds. Really? Uh, pheasants, pheasants forever. Uh, in Nebraska, who'd have thunk it, you know? Uh, the Lis Hills of Nebraska, here they are trying to organize the local landowners to get some burning done before their, their pastures and the grasslands are completely taken over by eastern red cedar, this horrible invasive, it's a woody kudzu, right. just taking over the, the Great Plains, um, and do the burning. And they will provide burn trailers, fully equipped. They will provide guidance. They will do things. So this is an incentive to the locals. It gives them a little extra boost. So those are the groups, yeah, but they need, they need a coalition of these groups to muster at the state support so that they can get the legislature to at least not put laws that prohibit them from doing it. So Stay these various the animal specialist groups, do they connect with the other animal specialist group of the pheasants forever well, folks hanging out with the ducks another. unlimited yeah. folks? And <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, wildlife, uh, the wildlife groups are very important. It's interesting, the, the birders are very important in this. The Most of the eastern wildlife, certainly in the southeastern, all the endangered species live in fire-prone areas and mm. encourage burning. So the red-cacated woodpecker may be the greatest source of, of burning in the country right now because it, it lives in the longleaf pine, which has to burn. There isn't a lot of longleaf left. You burn. And some of the, I'll tell you, some of the best longleaf pine, red-cacated woodpecker habitat in the country is at Eglin Air Force Base, which is a zone where they explode munitions. Right. <laughs> and and this is burned. They burn it early in the season so that the munitions fires don't spread and the munitions start lots of fire and the greater the woodpecker density is closest to the, right. the ordnance zone. The other, mm -hmm. some of the best prairie, the best prairie in the United States is at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Of course, right. Where it's an artillery zone. So yeah. they burn, they're starting fires year-round. Yeah. So you get a great mix. It's and constantly it, burned. Whenever it's ready to burn, it's burned. That's some of the best prairie we got. Well, military bases <laughs> typically have very good conservation programs, right. in my experience. <laughs> so it sounds like if you get the wildlife guys together with the military guys, <laughs> and but there is a kind of a, a, an accidental set of right perspectives that it, I think you're pointing out here. And these are rays of hope. You've, you've they are rays of hope. The, the birds in the West Coast, you see, go the other way. Mm -hmm. So the Northern Spotted Owl, Mexican Spotted Owl have been instrumental in shutting down burning because some of these sites might, might get consumed. So we really have an East-West divide. We need far, more fire-friendly animals. Yeah. Well, I think the great example here, maybe one of the spectacular success stories in North America is Banff. National Park in Canada, which became very serious about burning. Uh, the Canadian Park Service had written into its legislation that they would have to, over a five-year period, meet the average burn for that period. So they were required by law to do burning. The average so, burn being sort of the natural, the natural what, what they would happen anyway. Now, nobody knows what that is, but they know there was right, right. <laughs> a whole lot of fire taken out. So they made up a number and they're going to try to meet it? Well, the other thing is that there, there are almost no lightning fires in Banff. Mm -hmm. 
so this was all set by indigenous peoples. Right. So, and they've got all these charismatic creatures there, the grizzlies, the elk, the wolves. Who like fire. All of those live in fire and burned areas. Right. None of them live in old growth forests. So if they, right. though the creatures are great leverage for them. You want, you want to keep grizzlies here? You better give them some berries to eat. And you're going to get that by burning. And so they do really edgy burning. I mean, they, edgy these, burning, what does that mean? Well, I consider, I consider lighting crown fires <laughs> within a kilometer of Banff City pretty edgy burning. <laughs> lighting crown fires. Yeah, they have prescribed crown fires. And, uh, crown fires is when it goes to the top of the tree yeah, and everybody that, freaks out. There's crown, it's crown, run for your lives. But that's because if you've got a wind and you've got slope, you know exactly where that fire's going. So you actually have very good control over it. So you want wind. Prescribed burning without wind is, is Well, that's dangerous. interesting. The wind tells you it's going. The wind tells you where wind. it's going. It also disperses some of the heat if you're not doing crown fires. Otherwise, it can cook underneath you, kill trees. So you want wind. And the more wind, in a sense, the better. You know where, it, you know it where that's going. It disperses heat. I mean, it well, otherwise, makes if the fire you have it, blaze. It just goes up. The fire... The fire mm -hmm. carries all the convective heat up to the canopy and it right. can kill the needles right. just by scorch. It doesn't have to burn them up. Uh -huh. And you see this all the time. You see these dead, these red needled trees mm -hmm. in burn areas. Well, they weren't burned out, just the heat. So what you want is enough wind to help disperse the heat and scatter it so you don't get that effect. And you get the, the added benefit. You know where that fire's going. You've got good, good I feel very confident when I've got a steady wind. The problem like is this. a steady wind. That's that's the term. I'm getting the sense here, and and uh, we'll we'll call this to a stop. But you know, add this to your talk because you know, work with the animals, work with the wild animals that are in some sense fire friendly. Uh, work with the wind, and you know I've always heard, oh God, it's windy, we're going to burn to death. No, it's 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 windy, and we're going to have a burn that we can uh, know what it's going to do. So you've got to pick up. We've got to start thinking outside the old triangle. Uh -huh. I, we had this, I mentioned the Wallow fire in Arizona, 538,000 acres fine. Well, it was patchy. I mean, not all of it was incinerated. Some of it was skipped. Some of it was burned lightly. Real mix. I thought we missed a terrific opportunity. That fall, that was a spring fire, wind-driven fire. That mm -hmm. fall, if I ran the zoo, mm -hmm. I'd have been in there burning mm -hmm. because you now have well-protected sites. You've got some stuff that's burned out. Nothing's coming back. You're, this is the time to burn. This is the perfect time to burn. And the next two years, I would be in burning out some of the places that were lightly burned but had a lot of needle cast, again, because you've got it protected. The cycle of, historic cycle of fire from a variety of ignition sources is probably three to eight years. Hmm. So now, five years, we haven't done anything. Well, we're going to let it heal. We've missed one burning cycle already. Mm -hmm. That presented us with an opportunity to build landscapes out of what was a mega fire presented as a catastrophe. No, this is also an opportunity, but you've got to be nimble. You've got to be able to go in. You've got to think differently than the way we've done it. You've got to be fire foragers. You've got to be seizing that opportunity. We've missed it. We've missed so many opportunities on these large fires. They presented a landscape that we could have built something out of the future. Now, it's not the design landscape, desired future conditions. Here's what the science tells us. Here's what we'll do. We just muster the political will and money, and we do it, and we move towards that goal. No, this is being, we're being presented with large-scale mashups. Mm -hmm. And that's how you have to think about fire management now. That's how you're going to do it. Stephen, I want a book from you. I think we all want a book from you, which is basically how to do wildfire right. And nobody else can write it. We want it from you. Thank you for okay, coming well, tonight. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs>